I'm Edie Lash and I'm inside the Hub Culture studio. The lights are falling outside, but I'm, de I'm delighted to be joined by a bright light inside. Ken Roth, Executive Director of Human Rights Watch. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. So we're, we've started day one of Davos mm -hmm. with a speech by the, the head of India, the leader of India. We're finishing the, the speech, or finishing the week with Trump, mm -hmm. two populist leaders. Right. Tell me how that frames your, yeah. how you see it. Well, what's interesting is people keep getting deceived by the name of Davos, the formal name, the World Economic Forum, and think they can come here and talk about only economics. So, you know, last year Xi Jinping came here and said, I'm for, you know, the global system, ignoring the fact that when it comes to sort of international human rights standards, he's crushing them. And we're seeing a bit of the same thing now. Modi came, um, the, the Indian prime minister, and, and Trump, at, you know, the great economic progress he's making, he talked about inclusive economics, but he utterly ignored the very divisive Hindu nationalists who are demonizing the Muslim minority in India and who are intent on getting anything but an inclusive political system. And I fear that Trump is going to do a bit of the same thing. He's going to say, you know, the American economy is booming and America first is working. But here he is, you know, building his government around, you know, racism, misogyny, xenophobia, Islamophobia. He's not going to address that stuff. And I think, you know, he's going to be pilloried because people here in Davos actually believe in the full panoply of, of globalization, including rights, not just economic progress. Tell me how you're viewing rights uh, in terms of this moment in history where we have extreme populism, nationalism. We also have some areas of, of terrifying war, which is being uh, mm. promoted by a bunch of states. You're working in Yemen, you're working in, in Libya. Mm. Tell me the, the, the trends that you've been seeing. Well, it's interesting. You know, a year ago, I think everybody was in despair because it seemed like the authoritarian populists were in the ascendancy. You know, Trump had just entered the White House. This year, it's actually, you know, less dire because we've seen enormous pushback, you know, real resistance. I think in many ways, the turning point was Emmanuel Macron's electoral campaign in France, where he, you know, openly embraced democratic values and showed that you didn't have to pretend to be a populist in order to win. Um, he confronted the populists and won overwhelmingly. And we've seen similar popular resistance in the U.S. We've seen people standing up to, you know, Viktor Orban mm -hmm. in, in, in Hungary or Jaroslav Kaczynski in Poland. Um, so, you know, that's the good news. But the problem is we do really lack leadership in many respects. Um, the U.S., you know, traditionally was an important voice on human rights, even if an inconsistent one. That's gone. No credibility at the moment. The U.K. is preoccupied with Brexit. So, you know, Germany is, is in the middle of coalition building. There are people like Macron in, in France or, or Trudeau in Canada, but it's, it's weak at the moment. And so in that void, you see, um, you know, disasters unfolding with the Saudis basically bombing and, and starving Yemeni civilians. You see the Burmese government, you know, launching this massive ethnic cleansing campaign against, at this point, 688,000 Rohingya Muslims. So there is a real need for leadership to stop these atrocities. You know, Syria and Russia continue to, to devastate the civilian population in eastern Ghouta or, or in Idlib. So I, I'm hoping that we're beginning to turn here. And, and I think everybody is eager to look at the speeches of, you know, Trudeau and Macron in Davos to see if, you know, they can begin to assert the leadership that is so lacking from places like Washington. I want to take a turn. You mentioned uh, the Rohingya atrocity that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been very interested in in this last year is following the importance of what happens in media and in particular in social media, mm -hmm. in spreading some of some falsehoods and some mm -hmm. and lies. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what thoughts you have on on how that has impacted that specific mm -hmm. issue? Well, I mean, I I personally am a fan of social media in that I think it you know empowers ordinary people. They don't have to channel their voice through the traditional media. You know, that said, anybody can use social media. And so what you've seen in a place like you know Myanmar or Burma is um, you know Buddhist extremists, and those do exist, um, using really the demonization of the Rohingya, who frankly are despised in much of Burma, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they are Muslim in a Buddhist nation, because they have darker skin, and, and just whipping up hysteria to the point that even Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, the Nobel Peace yeah. Prize winner, will not come to the defense of the Rohingya. And, and so it shows that, you know, there can be damage done as well as good. 
and there's a real need for the international community to step in the, in those circumstances. Unfortunately, there's been much too much deference given to Aung San Suu Kyi, even past the point where it's clear she's not going to do any good. Mm. And what's needed now is, you know, for example, targeted economic and travel sanctions against the military leaders behind the mass murder, rape, and arson that has driven out the Rohingya. And coming back to Europe, but staying with this idea mm -hmm. of, of migration and refugees and the, the mm -hmm. population's ability to assimilate and, and deal with this as an mm -hmm. issue. How have you seen this last year in Europe play out? Yeah. Well, you know, at this point, you know, because the route from Turkey has been pretty much closed by, by, by President Erdogan, the main route into, into Europe for migrants has been Libya. And the treatment of migrants in Libya is so horrendous that according to the International Organization of, the Organization of Migration, there are more migrants dying within Libya hmm. than trying to cross the Mediterranean. Now, Europe understands that, that the conditions there are really so dire that it can't send people forcibly back to Libya, but it's doing indirectly what it can't do directly by training the Libyan Coast Guard to just keep people in. Right. And that's utterly immoral. What's really needed is, is an alternative. And, you know, President Macron of France has talked about this, which is you need, you know, first of all, economic development in the sending countries. You need to address the repression in those countries. And you need to create other avenues to Europe, places where people who have an asylum claim can have that heard in a safe place, you know, not in Libya and not having to jump on a, a rickety boat across the Mediterranean. Do you have any hope for the Global Compact on Migration this year? Well, everybody's looking to it for some kind of global bargain, but um, I, I'm not overly optimistic because there is, you know, so much animosity toward receiving more migrants. And, you know, frankly, I think that until recipient countries do a better job of integrating their migrant population so that they're not seen as sort of separated ghettos, um, we're not going to see the shift in popular sentiment that's needed to be more welcoming of, of the influx that is sometimes needed. And thank you very much for stopping by the Hub Culture Studio. My pleasure to be here. Here in Davos, and I'm Edie Lush.